Well, we appreciate you coming on, man. We're fired up to have this conversation. Um, we'll get right into it, man. Welcome to the QB room. This is presented by Happy Dad. Why is this position so hard to figure out, right? Um, you and I have talked about it on just the two of us talking. We've talked about it on your show. Um, you talk about it a lot. Um, I do this for every draft. I rank these guys, get it notarized. Uh, it's kind of like my, you know, I'm, I, I turned 40 next year. So it's my like, all right, when I'm like 50, am I going to be coaching these guys? Am I going to be doing the same thing? And so I've just been, I'll just have a decade of hopefully continuing to be pretty close to what ends up panning out uh, and help some teams down the road. But um, for you, I mean, you've, you've had an interesting perspective on this, just like the, the off the top, like what is it that everybody keeps missing on? Cause it's closer to a batting average than a completion percentage, right? It's closer to like batting 350 is good. than you know, 60% is no longer good in the NFL at quarterback. So what is, what are the things that come to mind as to why this is so difficult for everybody? First of all, it might be my single favorite topic in sports mm. um, because I think for the longest time, and you guys know this, you know, people like, and it's not specific to drafting quarterbacks, but I think people find some satisfaction, some inner peace in assuming everybody else is terrible at their job. So how many friends have you had who thinks every GM is an idiot? You know, and it's certainly like I'm more into the basketball thing. I've done the draft for years. I go to the combine. You know, it's my it's my favorite actual event. I host the combine on TV for ESPN for five years. So I love the evaluation process of watching and learning and getting better at like, okay, wait, because this guy did this and it didn't work out. Is that an indicator or is that specific to him? So the more I would dig into quarterback, the more I came to the realization is I don't think, and I don't know if you guys will disagree, but like, I don't think collectively all these staffs and these people that have been doing it for decades are just terrible at it. I do think it's that hard. I do think it is like hitting a baseball. And so, you know, one year I focused on just the first rounders. I went through a 20 year draft. I had my own very, very rudimentary system of like bust starter question mark and being nice and grading the bust. It's a 50% bust rate just in the first round alone. And when I was younger, I think I could figure it out because how much I love college ball. Like you'd watch certain offenses, you'd watch certain quarterbacks and be like, okay, put up a ton of stats, but in that offense, it's not going to happen. And it was almost like the league just straight up dismissed them. The league has clearly been a lot better at like accepting different styles of quarterbacks from different kinds of offenses. But now instead of like thinking, I know the guys that'll be drafted and who have a chance. Now it feels like everybody's giving a chance been given a chance. And now I feel like I have, have even less of a read. Like every now and then there'll be a guy that comes along like an Andrew Luck. I remember watching him on the sideline and he threw a pick against SC. I watched him. I was on the sideline. He comes back. He was pissed, but he was only pissed at himself. And you could just tell he couldn't wait to go back out there. Goes out there, game winning drive, wins the game. Now granted, Andrew Luck was an easy one for all of us. So every now and then there's certain guys at the top. You're like, okay, that guy can't possibly miss. And yet we have a draft like the Baker draft where half of those guys, like immediately it was over for him. And so, you know, I have a couple different theories on it. And it used to be like, oh, completion percentage means something. Well, we know that doesn't mean anything now because there's so many easy throws in, at both levels. Um, you know, whenever I would look at, when I would, I would, I would look at like certain guys and think, Okay, well, he's won a ton. Well, that doesn't mean anything because there's plenty of guys that are great programs. There's programs where they win all the time and none of their quarterbacks are ever good in the NFL. And so then when I started looking into it and it plays off like the running back thing a little bit, like running backs are upset right now because the top tier running backs aren't making money. But when they argue that their longevity is like 2.8 years, Look at the rest of the positions. Wide receivers like right there on average length of the career, except the top guys are. And when you look at quarterback, it's not that much longer because you're averaging in every guy that's drafted, everybody that's in a roster and seeing how long they last. Like kickers have the longest careers in the NFL and it's just at like four years. So that running back argument wasn't that great. But then when I saw that in comparison to quarterbacks, okay, it was like, what else is happening? And I would ask Dill for about it. I would talk about it. And the only thing I could really think of is, you know, as soon as you get drafted, you barely get any reps. You know, if you're not a first rounder, you barely get any reps. And then it's kind of like, maybe you got a chance to start a couple games. It probably didn't go well because you haven't had any experience. And then you just get replaced by the next third or fourth rounder. So I felt like the NFL eats its own depth at the position because they're never developing anything. You know, if you're on a basketball team, even if you don't start, you're constantly playing basketball all the time against other NBA players. 
if you're a quarterback who's not getting first team reps, I don't know how you're ever getting better in like the game situation. And clearly I know the coaching thing has exploded and all sorts of things that you can put yourself in getting better at it. But the entire position isn't really developed beyond the guys that are given the chance. And it's basically a three-year chance. When you're drafted in the first round, you're basically given like a three-year chance. And then, then everybody just moves on from you. And I have my own numbers with all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if that's the answer, but it's, it's almost comical how bad the hit rate is and how much worse it is once you're a first rounder and you move on to somewhere else. It like never works out, almost never works out. And that's why like I know we'll get into golf a little bit, but what he's doing right now is pretty much unprecedented in recent NFL history. Yeah, and I've always looked at it like who's at fault here and and you kind of you kind of alluded to it, but is it is he, he a bust? And this is always my question. Is that player like you you write your list of busts, right? So 50% of them or or something close to it. Is he a bust or did they bust on developing him? And Absolutely, that's the right. part that the fans and the traditional media doesn't really have any like real exposure to, right? It's their own like subjective opinion on, well, well, he had this good receiver or he, that coordinator was good before, but it's like insider, you know, like for Kyle and I, who are like hearing the conversations for whether it's from agents or the players or the teammates, or we know that coach or whatever, I guess we have a stronger opinion about it, not necessarily right or wrong. Um, but I think, if you have the list of busts, significantly more often is it that they they busted on developing him. Then that player was a bust. And there's certainly players where it's like, that guy should not have been a first-round pick, right? Whether we determine that on the front end and we go, those people were wrong on draft night, or you fast forward, you, 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 know, you, you let it play out and you go, oh, yeah, that guy, that guy just wasn't very good or wasn't mature enough or didn't have the confidence in it. And, and for me, and we've talked about it, it, for me, it's always confidence and maturity. Those are the two things. But... When you look at teams that that I, I almost think there's another list of people that were almost busts, right? But like it clicked in year three, you know. And Josh Allen's a guy. The first two years they weren't very good in Buffalo, but his first year in Buffalo, he was throwing to Kelvin Benjamin was his number one. Like they did not have those pieces around him. It was a new coordinator. It was a new this. It was a new everything. Caught fire year three and became one of the best players in the league. But what if it was year three when he got hurt? instead of year one when he missed, I think, nine games with an elbow. And so there's also like it clicked year two, it clicked year three, or guys where they go, man, it was getting ready to click, and ugh, like he got hurt or whatever happened. And I just look at, you know, we, we both are really close friends with Sam Darnold and looking at what happened with the Jets and all that. Like he was thrown to Robbie Anderson and switch coordinators every year, and then they go get Le'Veon Bell. They trade all these things away to get that. They McCagnin's the GM, then they fire him after they let him draft all the players and all that. And so I think probably because I'm just so in it in the draft, I think on the list of the guys who are busts, oh, it, it's so, it is so much more frequent that they are just put in a terrible position to succeed. And it's just a subjective opinion because there's so many different data points, right? Who's calling plays, who they throw into, who's blocking, who's the division, all of those things. But these teams, they can't get out of their own way when it comes to developing them. And I look at Trevor Lawrence and as big of a disaster as the Urban Meyer thing was for a year, the craziest thing that no one talks about, he was in a 50% rep split competition with Gardner Minshew until week one. He got 50, as the number one pick in the draft, got 50% of the reps. They did not announce the starter until Wednesday of week one, and then they traded Gardner. So they invested 50% of the offseason into a Philadelphia Eagles backup quarterback. And so it's like, even the with the number That's one insane. pick, they're trying to That's sabotage crazy. it. Deshaun Watson was not the starter until halftime when they benched Nate Peterman, split 50% of the reps that year as the tw uh, 12th pick in the draft. And so it's just like, on and on and on and on teams can knock it out of their own way when it comes to like in my opinion borderline sabotaging these guys when you essentially go all in on them so where does that factor in with you in terms of when you look at was that that guy was it the kid was it the player or was it the situation well i'll just admit off the top there's no way i would i would have the intel of like because i'll even talk to you guys when we're at elite 11 and i'll you know it's not just you i'll talk to your staff and it's one of my favorite things i get to do because i can't believe like how good all of you are, like looking at some of the top high school kids. And every time they'll be like, oh, this guy, this is going to happen here or this guy there, but I wish he wasn't at this program and all these different things. And your hit rate is insane. Like I rave about it when I come back from it every single time. And then later on I'll share like, oh yeah, they called this and that's exactly what happens. I don't want to say it ahead of time. Um, 
that's not the information I would know, but I'm glad you said it that way because even with basketball, I get really frustrated when somebody's like, oh, this guy's a bust. It's like, well, no, he was going to be good. He got hurt. Like Greg Oden was going to be good. He got hurt. So like to me, they're different categories. But if I were just using it as like production with the resource of a first round draft pick, um, there was just all these players that didn't, didn't end up doing anything. And like, here's, I guess I, it's not like pushing back on your argument, but I'd, I'd ask you this. When I looked at all the first rounders from 2014 and I went all the way up into 2019 because I felt like, you know, I can't make this too recent because we don't know the end of the story for a lot of these quarterbacks, right? All the quarterbacks that were first rounders that the team then moved on from, it was it was basically over. Not one of those players, and I know a playoff win is really hard, but Tannehill's the only first rounder that won a playoff start with his second team. And that's why Goff is like in line to maybe do this. And so if it were the system, if it were the evaluation, if it was the support system around it, not to say all these guys are actually bad at quarterback because there's a ton of truth in what you said. There's also a part of me that wonders, well, if it were a mistake of the first organization wouldn't we have more success stories on the second or third stop for some of these quarterbacks? Or does the league just label you this and you don't you have like no chance, which could be its own problem? No, I think that's totally fair. And the other thing is if you trade a first round pick, I, I, I lived this with my brother who demanded a trade out of Cincinnati and was willing to retire in exchange for it. They, if they trade you, they're trading you to the worst possible spot. Because the what they can't have happen, what the Bengals couldn't have happen, is trade Carson Palmer to a place that he becomes a Super Bowl MVP, and now it implodes. So it it took Al Davis passing away, Hugh Jackson being the offensive coordinator, the head coach who was his college offensive coordinator, and getting two first round picks, which was bananas at the time, to trade him to the only organization that I think everyone in the media space would be. That's the only organization right now that's worse than Cincinnati. And so when you look at that, it's like. Well, who, who, where's Cleveland going to send Baker? You know, where's the Jets going to send Sam? Where are these teams? Well, they're not going to send them to a really good landing sauce, soft landing spot. And obviously when they're, when they get cut and they're free agent, they can go do their thing. But I mean, I would say Mitch Trubisky is one of the only ones that actually went to a, probably a better franchise when he went to Pittsburgh or actually, no, he went to, yeah, he went to Buffalo, but he, sorry, that never mind. He went to Buffalo and backed up first. I forgot that. So uh, the other thing is like they're they're selling you to the you know to a spot well, where it's gonna be tough to succeed. And I, I know I want Kyle to jump in here, but I'm really glad you brought that up because I even brought it up when I did the monologue on all this because there's also a like okay, but let's look at what the transaction is. If you didn't get it done with the first team that drafted you, they want to move on from you, they're probably not gonna want you to be successful somewhere else. And then if you're another team that's like well, we don't have the top pick. We don't, we, you know, we've screwed up quarterback the last four or five times. So we'll take the guy that didn't work out three years ago. You're absolutely right. More, more often than not, that franchise isn't very stable. You know, it's, it's not, if it was already good, it wouldn't need the retread quarterback. So to just judge it based on do any of them have playoff success, I'm glad you said it because it can be really unfair and it's something I brought up. I guess I just like through a decade of it, I went, wow, that number's zero. <laughs> that number's zero post Tannehill. That's unbelievable. Zero. And people forget when Tannehill, his playoff run, his stats were like the first game in the playoffs, he was like 8 of 15 for 65 yards, and Derrick Henry had like 280 yards. And then the next game, he was like 7 of 11 for 70 yards, and Derrick Henry had like 280 yards. So that team was just unbelievable as well. And I had a hard time with the Tannehill stuff in Tennessee because when you stacked his numbers up in a two-, three-year run – against the other QBs, you're like, wait, is he as good as these guys? I mean, I know what these numbers all say, but it almost felt like at a time there with Tannehill where he was the college quarterback who was in the Heisman race, and these numbers were absurd. The efficiency, like, look at, I mean, I think his QBR touched 70 one year with Tennessee, and, you know, I would go in and do my own previews and think of, like, wait a minute. Like, I don't, I don't think of him as that guy, but him having that kind of success – Tennessee. The funny thing is when you look back at Tannehill's numbers with Miami removed from it, you're like, was he way better than than we remember? But 
the only playoff game that they played, I believe, during Tannehill's tenure, Matt Moore had to start anyway. So, um, you know, eventually you're not you're not getting into the playoffs. You're not winning any playoff games. But if you go back and look at the Miami start, you're, you're kind of like, wow, those numbers actually look a bit better. And then they got even better. And then obviously now towards the end of it, they're probably going to have a decision on their hands. Well, you just said a name said- I want to... Real quick, you said a name I want to hit on real quick. So I, I'm part of the, in my opinion, the worst draft class in NFL history, 07, Jamarcus's oh, really? class. Wow. Um, and the Who player else is from, in that class, Jordan? Uh, Jamarcus, Brady Quinn, uh, John Beck, Kevin Cobb. Uh, Trent Edwards was a third-round pick, started hot in Buffalo. Um, Troy Smith won the Heisman. He was a sixth-round pick wow. that year. Drew Stanton was a second-round pick. So the player that played the longest, the most years – was undrafted rookie free agent Matt Moore. He outplayed everybody. And then the second was, was Stanton because he got a bunch of years at the end with uh, with Bruce Arians. But like the irony of that, I mean, there's a lot of quarterbacks. I think it was three or four first-rounders that year. Matt Moore, the undrafted guy out of Oregon. I have to. I have to because we brought up Kevin Cobb. I liked Cobb. Now, I don't know if it was Andy Reid's offense there. He also had one of the most amazing – career earnings runs because oh. of how they had to like redo the contract and they did it again. I'd like to think if he hadn't had the concussion problems, like he might've been, you know, real enough to, to have the job. But Van Pelt constantly makes fun of me for like, I had this epiphany during the Cobb year where I was like, man, I kind of like this guy. I think he's got something no, to do. Cobb I think I was could play. Okay. I'm glad you said that. I, I was I, even I, out. So I played against him three times in college, went to double overtime, I think twice in overtime regular once. And had just Houston and UTEP just shootouts, and that dude can play. He can run it. It was Andy. It was it was, it was Andy Reid. Andy. It, nobody had him going in the second round. He was like the fourth pick of the second round. Nobody had him. And as soon as Andy Reid took him, we were like, "All right, Cobb's for real then." And then so that's why like the same thing when Mahomes comes around, everyone's like, tenth pick, the kid from Texas Tech." It's like, nope, that guy knows exactly what he wants in his system. Knows exactly what he wants. I so even yeah, had you're, a- you're on with Cobb. I had a night where I was out. I think I was with McShay, and we were in uh, Old Town, Fort Worth, you know, the stockyard part of Fort Worth. And some guy walked up to me and he was I'm Cobb's roommate from college. He'd love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> the Cobb so, stand. <laughs> he was so excited. There was this national radio guy talking up Cobb all the time. I'm sorry, Kyle. You, you had something in there. I, I, I think I trampled you a bit. No, you're all good. I, I love to hear the Kevin Cobb stories. I have nightmares about him in Arizona. I, I was grew up in Scottsdale, and I thought he was going to be our savior, and he didn't end up being our savior, unfortunately. But um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on – first round quarterback, especially like top picks playing early. I think Jordan, when you were playing, when Carson was getting drafted, the the first round guy didn't normally play early in his career, right? You sat, you learned, you figured it out. Now it's like these guys are learning by fire and kind of goes back to our old conversation of you kind of get this three-year chance and whatever you put on tape is what you put on tape. And then they either stick with you or move on. And then you get guys like Bryce Young this year who's struggling early in his career, but is a very talented and great player. And then CJ Stroud on the opposite end of that is is playing super well. Where do you stand on guys playing right away if they're a top pick? Okay. Well, this is another one of these topics where I feel like I've talked to a million guys and I've gotten a million different perspectives on it because, you know, one of the great things about ESPN and being there as long as I was, you know, whether it was a co-host or a guy I became friends with, or you go to the green room and argue about Westbrook and Steph Curry with five NFL players waiting to go on TV, like I've heard a million different opinions of this. Um, Look, I think a lot of times it used to be kind of self-preservation for the coach. So if you had a high enough of a pick to take a top quarterback, it means you either just hired and you have plenty of time or you're about to get fired, right? Because the coordinator has to come in and tell the owner or the new head coach if it's a new coordinator, like, hey, I can fix this guy. Like nobody gets that job coming in going, you've got the wrong guy. So you have to get the job saying you can fix the guy. And if you're a coach who's – Maybe, you know, the fan base, media, ownership's running out of a little patience. I used to think, like, the play was take the guy high, don't play him until, like, week 9 or 10, hopefully get some kind of buzz. He's healthier than everybody else. And then you could argue, look at all this momentum we had at the end of the year, and then you get to stay. So I think there was a decision I felt like in the past used to really be motivated by self-preservation of head coaches, which obviously still happens to some degree now. But they're playing immediately. Like, the Aaron Rodgers thing – You know, people point to it all the time. And I'm not even saying you guys are doing it, but it gets pointed out as this like this standard. And it's like, well, no, Favre kept like hinting at retiring and then he would come back, which, you know, Rogers during those years, I mean, back when he used to do like he did a couple interviews with us and and I remember him being pretty 
pretty straightforward that like it wasn't that great of a deal and it was super annoying for him and that Favre kind of loved being in charge of what was going to happen um now, I heard it even described one time like as if the, the organization was like being held hostage by Favre. But that's a really unique situation. That Rodgers would have played earlier, and Rodgers is so good, eventually he would have figured it out. So, you know, it scares me a bit when you see guys with less than like the 25 college starts, especially with the way it's been kind of working lately with like the classes being all over the place with everything that's happened with college sports recently, that if you're coming into the league, and playing the hardest position in sports, and you haven't done it more than 20, 25 times in college. You know, I remember when Mark Sanchez declared and Pete Carroll was sitting next to him, basically kind of shaking his head, thinking like, you should come back another year. And I don't know if that's why Sanchez failed or not, but I, I think guys are coming in so early and then no one has any patience and they're playing everyone immediately. But then as I say that, I go, look, we all realize whatever's difficult, you're not going to get any better at it until you actually do it. So you can prep and prep and prep and watch all the film, uh, you know, I think it's dependent on the quarterback. I think it's obviously situation has a lot to do with it. I mean, I look at Mahomes and McShay's told to see stories about how his first year with Kansas City, he didn't know how to identify the Mike linebacker. And you're like, what? He's like, I never had to do that. Like, I don't I know what the hell was going on. So if Mahomes had played for somebody else immediately, like is Mahomes on a second team? That seems impossible because I think he's the greatest throw over football I've ever seen. But it seems to be leaning towards, despite some, like, I'm not, hey, rest everybody because look at, you know, don't play anybody their first year uh, because that's that's the standard of success. I, you know, I think it's really based on the individual. But there seems to be no patience anymore, and they're getting thrown right in there, sometimes with very limited college snaps, maybe two seasons. And the churning of these, like, it could be getting worse than some of the 50% bust numbers that I've come up with in the past. Yeah, I, I think it's just a healthy balance between the two. Like, you have to have that bridge guy in place. I think one of the most important things, too, and we're going to get into the conversation around backup quarterbacks in terms of when they go in and play. But I just think the the older veteran in the room when you have a young guy, right? You want some, you, you're having the right person. So, I mean, Mahomes, there's so many different ways to break apart him going to Kansas City, not playing, wasn't ready, whatever. But also just being learning how to be a pro from Alex Smith, that's a best-case scenario. And... Kyle, I don't know if you were, I'm pretty sure you were there. So I helped Oakley in the NFL get their deal done uh, to become the on-field partner. And one of the things that we did is, is figure out who Oakley should sign. And so we end up, they signed Patrick Mahomes to be the face of Oakley. So after his second year, when he went nuts and threw 50 touchdowns, right? Didn't play his rookie year, second year. Well, that's Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, and Kyle's draft class. And so we did the shoot for Oakley, like the first commercial at the place where we throw. And so, Kyle, were you there when, when we were shooting that commercial with Pat? Yeah, I know I Josh and Kyle were. I know Josh mm -hmm. and Sam were there. Okay, so it was the three of you guys. And do you remember the conversation when uh, Sam or somebody was asking? So, again, this is Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Kyle Allen, going through draft prep, rookie, getting to ask dude who I think was just MVP questions about last year. And, you know, one of you guys asked him, I think it was Josh, hey, when did you, like, figure out all the protections to get comfortable? And he's like, yeah, dude, it wasn't until, like, week five or six. And we're like – dang, that's crazy. You got all the way into week five or six of your rookie year and you really weren't strong protections. He goes, no, 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 no. This year. Like, yeah, as the whole playing. season, yeah. not playing, still figuring it out. And then, and then on the fly, piecing it together. And it just shows you like, so there's a, somebody that a lot of people would put as the best, on a trajectory to the best guy ever. Well, what if he would have gone to a spot that was impatient? What would that have looked like? Right. And what and what are some of these guys that that get a chance to sit and play? And if they can't play, like if Jordan Love can't play after watching for three years, does he get three? Or is that a shorter leash? Because you've been sitting and watching. And my brother was a best case scenario. He got to number one pick, sit for a year behind John Kitna, who was a consummate pro, teach the game, how to handle everything, and set him up. So that was just a, a great transition into his young career. Um, but I want to th throw this question at you, Ryan. So there's a lot of things that we wouldn't factor into evaluating a quarterback. Like you mentioned completion percentage, that can be misleading. Winning, that can be misleading. I feel like this position is more wide open than it's ever been. We got 5'10", 5'11", guys winning Heismans, going number one overall. We've had two quarterbacks from North Dakota State selected in the top three uh, picks in the draft, like in the last six years, seven years, right? And you got we got a 5'11 kid from Hawaii who's a lefty 
who's fifth overall in lighting up the league right now, right? And won a national title. So it's just like wide open. You don't have to be six foot four from one of these 10 schools anymore. So uh, it's more equal opportunity than it's ever been. Um, what is the most, what, what would you look at? If you were to argue that this guy's going to be awesome, what would be the thing you stand on? So I love Saturdays, right? I love having all the TVs up and I love watching all the guys and, you know, paying attention to some of the recruiting stuff. And so when you're like, oh, okay, this guy's supposed to be a big deal, right? Um, although I'd love to see some reclassification of like, you shouldn't be a dual threat if you can only run. To me, that's one threat. <laughs> yeah. But, that's a good way to put but, it. Yeah. But we yeah. only, no one's we'll going to say that. <laughs> dual threat. Yeah. Like, I'd like to see it. There should be dual threat, pocket, and then one threat. Um, yeah. <laughs> because I remember watching Terrell Pryor on the sideline in person. And I went, uh, are you serious? Like, this is like, this is the guy. And I, you know, I'm not trying to diss Terrell Pryor, but like, it was, it was pretty clear at, early on. I'm like, I, the, the throwing stuff is a challenge for him. And this is, this is my answer to your thing. Cause I feel like I didn't even give you an answer on the rest thing other than just making in all the different philosophies that I've heard on it. And that's kind of the point is a lot of this is, like, I'll talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Then I'm like, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer for you on it because of how lost I am at this position. But there is a simple answer that I'll give you on what I look for. I look for a guy that looks like he knows what he's doing on third and seven. Okay? There are so many college offenses. There's so many college quarterbacks where if you take that first thing away from him on third and long, he's toast. He's done. It's, you know, like Jalen Hurts used to even do it way too much, I thought, at Bama, which led to them moving on from him. But it was never arm strength. It wasn't his presence. It wasn't any of that. Everybody loves the guy. But he got really comfortable because he could get away with it with Bama too because they were so good. Is he would look for one thing, and if it wasn't there, then he wasn't comfortable going through the rest of it. So we can talk progressions. We can talk, talk all that different stuff. Like I remember once when a scout fully like explained to me how Baylor is like the easiest system because they make it so easy for their quarterbacks. And then he was like, and by the way, like look at their numbers and look at them not being a priority when it comes to the draft because you know when you're getting one of those guys with the system they used to run. It's been like two regimes since then where it was just like this one side of the field high school stuff that they make it really easy. They put up huge numbers. So Baylor's going like, what are we doing wrong if we're scoring 40 plus a game? Um, but I, I think it breaks down to like something really simple. When I watch a college kid play, does he look comfortable on the third and longs? Because it's pretty amazing how many, even at some of these top programs, look uncomfortable. So I don't, I don't have like that one number because I, I think that's really what it is. Hey, when the bullets are flying – and the first read isn't there, and somebody gets beat, can you keep the play alive? And I'm not talking about running around, because that's all, to me, just extra stuff. It's not the foundation. It's like having a deck on your house, but you're like, okay, cool deck, but you know, you're not going to be living outside in the deck all year round. And you know, when I think about the guys that translate, it's when I'll notice um, – and it doesn't mean they're all going to be good, but it's just it's just something I always kind of go back to. Like on third and seven, third and eight, do you look lost or you look like a guy who maybe will make these decisions on Sunday? And even that's imperfect. It's kind of like the Ohio State quarterback theory that I've had and I think other people have had is, is when your first read is open so much in college, same at Alabama with Jalen Hurts, when you get to the NFL, you got, you got to go through guys like JT Barrett, Dwayne Haskins, um, even – quarterbacks before them the Ohio State Cardale. quarterbacks for what yeah. Cardale you know Justin Fields is playing better but early in his career struggled you go through those guys and and it's for whatever reason when you come from a school where your first read is always open here's the design the design is so good your, your players are so good then you get to the next level and you struggle and that's why this year coming out I was worried about CJ Stroud now he could throw it better than any of those guys and he sat in the pocket and got through his reads better but it's almost doing them a disservice at these really good schools where your first read's always there. And as long as your eyes are in the right spot, you're going to have success. I, let me just jump in here because you're speaking my language here. You're saying something I've said. Because when you think about Ohio State, they're better talent-wise than 11 of the 12 teams easily, okay, mm -hmm. every year. And the only one in the debate would be Michigan. But mm -hmm. some of those other games, it's a significant gap. And yeah, like I've been around, I've watched enough games that even some of the middling SEC teams, you're like, oh, that guy's a first round corner though, or that DN, he's going to go 15. And you're like, this team isn't even that good. And when I look at other than like Iowa, who just actually has way more pros than anybody realizes, I was always fearful of all the Ohio State quarterbacks. I can see that post in my head right now. 
that's that's wide open. They get the receiver inside, going away. The safety's already five yards behind it, and you're throwing a pop up to the numbers. You know, you're not. You don't even have to like really muscle it in there. You're throwing a pop up, and it's wide and it's open all season long. So the same thing. Now, granted, people have told me that play the position. Stroud throws the ball better than any of the other guys did. So that's sure a benefit to him. But then we've also realized, like, if arm strength were everything, then Kyle Bowler would be in the Hall of Fame. So I. I'm so happy to see this with Stroud because it was getting to a point with me where I was like, I don't know if I would mess with any of the Ohio State quarterbacks because of exactly what you just said. 100%. And I think like that's that's got to be something that's piled up over the years. And Stroud, I think when you look at Stroud's tape at Ohio State compared to guys like Cardale and guys like JT, his pocket movement and his pocket presence. And another thing like I think that for me, when you're looking at a first round guy and and what you think goes into a guy that's going to translate into the NFL, and this is I think something really good with Caleb Williams is their pocket presence and their pocket movement is so important. How comfortable they are, and it kind of goes into the same thing you're saying on third and seven. How comfortable are you? Do you look like you know what's going on? I like see when this things with- break down, right? When things break down, can you still be a guy? Because the offenses 100%. are so good now, um, and they're very regimented too. You know, some of it I think is excessive, like excessive just to prove that you're doing all these things offensively. But again, I didn't play the position, so I, there's a lot that certainly I don't understand. But I think the offense is like, it's a great example of Stroud. Things broke down in that Georgia game. Things broke down, and that guy balled. And I mean, that was the national championship game against Georgia. Mm-hmm. There's a place that this is playing out right now, and I don't have the stats in front of me, but I saw it I saw it when, during one of the games. So I'll say this before I get into it. I, I'm pulling for Zach Wilson. I want him... Partly because I want him to have a great year, and I, I really love what Saul is doing. I love that. I also want to see Aaron come back. <laughs> so I, I, I'm pulling for, for Zach Wilson, but I did see a stat. And it, on the evaluation, you would say, how's his athleticism? Uh, you'd say, more than you need. He's, he's, like, he's mobile. He can cut. He can change direction. He's fast. Arm talent. Dude, he can make a ton of throws. But I saw a stat right now so far this season where like his passer rating when throwing to the first read – was like 80 something or above or 90 something like solid the one of the second one was like 20 something and so it's just like well there you go right because they don't need him to throw for 400 yards they need him to be able to progress through and get the ball out of his hands and find completions and extend drives and allow the defense and all. so like there's a place where high pick you know all, all the physical traits you go check 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 but that's the thing right is like how's he look on third and seven and I think that I, I like that you point that out because I can watch a power five, you know, big time college. I can evaluate a kid, how he handles that. I can evaluate a smaller school. I watched the quarterback from Georgia state yesterday, right? An agent told me to watch this guy, right? So like you can change the level of play and you can still either look like you know what you're doing on third and seven or not, right? Like that actually translates and it's, and it's less about the talent and the ability and who, who's happening around you. It's like, can you operate in this system and can you find completions and manufacture them? Yeah, because sometimes I wonder, like, are we being tricked even more? Are we being tricked even more? Because the NFL has far more of an open mind of what college production means. And I'm sure there are, you know, I don't know if Next Gen dabbles enough into the, into the Saturday stuff. But if there was a way to prove to me that like a guy's efficiency doesn't drop off that significantly from the first look to the second one, I just think some of these offenses are so good in college. You just, I mean, Kyle, like you tell me like different stuff that you had to play in. Like, Oh, I mean, I was in, I was in that system in college. So I, I didn't make a mic play till I got to the NFL. I didn't read coverages. We were reading leverages off of defenders. If he's inside leverage, throw the out. If he's outside leverage, throw the dig. Like I didn't know what, cover six was or three week or Tampa, you look at like, one side of the field too basically well, like, yeah well it was just options side, right you right. you looked you would look across the field and depending on your routes pick the guy who has the best leverage to win right i'm not i didn't make mike like six man protection i said 900 to the line and then i looked at my receivers and then the line made their point and i didn't know if i was hot i didn't know what where the blitz was coming from i remember marlon humphrey we we're playing alabama speaking of that they had 10 first round picks on their defense that year. Marlon Humphrey came on a corner blitz. I had no clue he was coming. I turn around the last second, and he just hits me right in my chin. And I'm like, I don't really have an answer for how to not get hit in the chin again. Like, I don't know how to fix that. You know, what and do so, they say at the sideline? It's 
they were just like, oh, yeah, it was a corner blitz. And I was like, okay, so how are we going <laughs> to yes, pick that up? <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, great. Let's just move on and hope it doesn't can happen block again, him next time. <laughs> yeah, can we get the running back or maybe the ta- – oh, yeah, it's just – but it, it's it's just the way it is, and and I think there are some like we talked to DJ uh, Uyungalele, I think that's how you say his last name. We had him on here last week, and he was going through Oregon State's offense, and Oregon State's offense is incredibly detailed NFL. Fo- like he knew more about his protections than some of the ones I do here. You know, he's so dialed on it, and that is something that'll translate. Now you still have to play well on the field, but I think some of those things are another thing to look into, and in, and in something that translates onto the field as well. But um, I want to wrap this up and move on to backup quarterbacks before we have you on here for too long, because I think the backup quarterback conversation, I heard your um, 10 minute video on that. We listened to that before we had you on and just about the amount of starts in the room, how there's so many rooms where guys don't have many starts. And then there's a couple guys like Andy Dalton in the league who have had 80 plus starts for you. If you had to build a backup quarterback room right now with a two and a three, around a young guy who would it be (laughs) uh okay let me let me think about it because you know i think jordan made a really good point like this happens on basketball teams a lot like i just i'm just going to give myself a little time here to to think about this um yeah we can go silent if we can cut this part out if you want yeah no no but like here's a good basketball analogy for it because you know whenever a team's rebuilding in basketball, it annoys the head out of me because everybody would be like, oh, well, you know, they're rebuilding, so that guy's 26. Like, you can't have him on the team. He's on a different timeline. It's like, dude, you can't have 12, 18 to 21-year-olds on a basketball no. team, okay? Because every one of those guys thinks he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Like, And you, you guys both get this. You played. Like, the level of irrational confidence that you have to even have to get to any point where you're getting paid for this stuff is off the charts. But it doesn't always mean that it's like, the best dynamic for a quarterback room or for a basketball team. So you need a couple guys on your basketball team that know that they're not going to play, that they're not the priority. So whenever I see like a young QB room with zero experience, I'm like, well, what, what's the point of this? Like, why would you actually be going about it this way? Um, You can't, you can't have the third quarterback wondering why he's not starting. And in basketball, sometimes rebuilding teams, they'll have the 11th guy wondering why he's not taking the most shots. Um, All right, let me go through this. Well, while you're going through it, I'll say this about a room, and I thought it was interesting. Recently is when when Aaron went down, they were obviously scouring the league for, okay, who who can we get? We're going to give Zach Wilson a chance, but who can we get around the league? And they call Houston. And they say, we want Case Keenum. Case Keenum's the three there. Davis, Davis Mills is the two. Case Keenum's the three. Guy with a ton of starts, Case Keenum. Like, can we take him as your three? We need him in this room. And Houston says no because of how valuable he has been to CJ Stroud. He's not, he might not even be dressing on game day. I think he is because of the new quarterback rule, but for a guy that's not even going to play, most likely, if CJ goes down, they want him that bad in the room because of how valuable he's been to CJ. Yeah, see, that that's the other part. Like, clearly, Chase Daniels doing something right. Like, clearly, he has a personality that guys are like, hey, he's good in the room. He helps with our prep. And, you know, I guess you could argue, like, if he had to give you a start. Like, it's kind of like the Brian Hoyer thing, where if Brian Hoyer has to start a couple games, you're not going to hey, feel Hoyer like played well on Sunday, man. I've, I've, he we're did. Playing New England. We're playing New England this week, and I was watching the tape this morning. He was slinging it for however many years he's been in the league. I was impressed. All right, so I would go – I'd probably go Jacoby Brissett as like my that. backup. Now, Brissett may still be in a mode of like, hey, I got screwed a couple times. Like, I should be the starter. So, but I just, I feel like if you're talking level of like, get me through two weeks, I think Brissett has a much better chance and based on stuff that we've seen than other guys that are out there. Now, you guys are clearly going to know all the personality stuff a lot better than I would. Um, No, I like, I think Jacoby's a great pick. And I, I don't think he is that way either. I think he is at a point in his career where he had his chance in, Indy didn't go well, and he's had lots of great chances after that to be a well-paid backup. I I tell you, I kind of fell in love with Malik Willis when I met him at Elite 11. Um, Mm -hmm. So that might be more of a personality thing, wondering if there's any kind of ceiling in there because he's still kind of gotten held up 
with everything that's going on. Dude, I'm going through them again right now, and I go through this pretty regularly. There are so many guys. Like, Jake Browning's the backup to Cincinnati. Like, he, yeah. he's never played. Like, he's just never played. And you're, you're Cincinnati, and you're going, okay, we're good here because we're just hoping a guy that always looks like he's going to get hurt isn't going to get hurt. Um, I've been, and that's, a, I've been, and that's, that's a little close to the vest because he's a, a client of mine. But, but the, the, to strengthen that argument, they made, he beat out Trevor Simeon. They made him the two knowing Joe was hurt. I mean, Joe hurt his calf before cut day. You know what I mean? So Joe is entering into the season with a injury where you just don't know. I mean, it's a calf. Like, you, I don't know. Like, it could get worse. It could get better, all that stuff. And so just to kind of strengthen that argument, like, yeah, that, that's even more bullish. They're really bullish on him. But, like, to go in knowing, yeah, my starters had an ACL in three years. He's had an ACL and now has this. And so, yeah, right. Like, yeah, I, teams are I, with it. I love what Dorian Thompson Robinson did at UCLA. I couldn't believe he was already starting a game. And clearly, they already made the change on that with PJ getting the start for Deshaun this past weekend. Um, I'm trying to think if I should go Mike White here. Should I go younger guy who's played a little bit? Brett Rippon might be in, the, in play here, too. I just, as long as with Brissett, I need at least one guy where I go, okay, we're prepping this week. We have a chance. As opposed mm-hmm. to a complete unknown. But like that's the point that I always make about the back of quarterbacks. Look at how many of these guys have never played. And so what you're doing is you're replacing anyone with any experience because you're like, okay, well, we already know his ceiling because new is always better than known when it comes to quarterbacks. Same thing with basketball draft picks. Like, oh, wow, this is new. We don't know the answer. Well, that's way more valuable to what is a C or B minus answer. So the NFL will... Like, they don't even allow themselves to have any depth with this. Like, it's it's just funny every time I look at it. You know, I actually, I know Tyrod made a mistake on the option at the end of the half. But, like, he's another guy that clearly if he had to give you a couple starts, it'd be fine. But I, I don't think I could have a Tyrod and then also a Brissette because it might be two guys. Like, the third guy mm-hmm. would have to be... I don't know. Give me Malik Cunningham. I don't know. Um, it would have to be somebody who's a total, <laughs> total <new>. project. <laughs> what was that, Jordan? Somebody new. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A to- total unknown. Who uh, I think at some point wasn't even listed at quarterback. So, uh, the, the, look, you guys have been in those rooms. It. Everybody's competitive. You guys are all really competitive guys. But there has to be a bit of sacrifice for the the greater there good of the to. football team. And yeah. you need guys that understand that, or guys that you know, have had a recalibration on where their career is at. But what the NFL likes to do, at least with more than half of these teams, they're totally fine. And I, I don't blame them for not having third stringers. Like, you go through it. The guys never play. Um, but there's a lot of second stringers out there that have extremely limited experience for the most important position in, in sports. And these franchises are okay with it. And then they're just going to – if that guy doesn't play for three years, he's just going to get replaced with the next guy who's never played for three years. And, again, that's kind of where I get back to this point of – it doesn't even allow itself to have depth at this position. Yeah, I I, I live this, so I, I have a uh, strong take on it. But I think you got to have a three because you got to have somebody in the building, not on practice squad, somebody in the building that you're actually developing to potentially be your two. So in 2010, when they had the new CBA, they got rid of the third quarterback thing. It just poof, 30 jobs are gone. You know what I mean? And it's like, you're talking about, there's a small group of people that are good enough to play in the NFL and you just got rid of, it wasn't really 30, it was probably like 20 something because some teams kept three. All of a sudden, like, that's a large percentage of the available jobs that are just gone, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of guys that aren't in a room now. And at that time, you were not putting a quarterback on practice squad. No shot. So you just literally had two guys in the room. And if your starter got hurt, you were calling a guy on your list. I was throwing with my buddy Brad Vaughn, who was a firefighter when I would go to Chicago week seven or to Jacksonville week four, you know what I mean? I was literally throwing at a high school to high school football players. And so like, I got to have that three um, on the backup. Let me throw you a name. Cause this might be interesting to watch. Play Kyle out. Trask. Unknown. I don't know. Second round pick. I don't know. Hasn't played. I don't, I don't, I, and, like, and what also, am I supposed to do? Like, am I going to go, Hey, Easton stick is my guy. You know what I mean? Like there's so many, I'm going yeah. through it again right now, you guys. And I'm looking at it. Well, going, let me like, give you one. I can't even and, pick and some that. reasons behind it. All right. I'm going to throw Jarrett Stidham at you. And here's why I want somebody, I, I want the element of unknown. This guy has potentially a very high ceiling. That's the gambler's mentality. And I think that's honestly why a lot of people miss on these is because they deep down in their heart of hearts, they're just kind of gambling here. 
I think this guy is going to be really good and sure. I'm going to get a return if I'm right. Right. Which is essentially what gambling is. And so, or the stock market or any of this stuff. And so Jarrett Stidham was a couple things why I would say like, here's a quintessential ideal backup for a real, a relatively unknown situation at starter, right? New coach, new ownership group, right? Russell struggled. Like that's an, a little, you can't guarantee me Russell Wilson starting for the Broncos next year. Right. I, it's, it's a little up in the air right now. So Jared, I, one of the foundational elements I think a backup has to have is context for great football and great quarterback play. Have you been in a room where there's been winning great football and great quarterback play? Dude, what is your context on the position? And Jared's is not just Baylor and Auburn. He was the two behind Tom Brady as a rookie, as a fourth round pick. They made him the two. They cut Hoyer, right? So his context for the position so far is Tom Brady, Derek Carr, right? Same system, right, with Josh McDaniels, and now has had some time behind Russell Wilson. So the context for the level of play is high, right? I, I know what good looks like. I know what great looks like. I know what winning looks like. A lot of people have context for bad quarterback play, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is, is you got to have some starts. And Jarrett's only got a couple, but it's gone really well, right? Last two games of the year last year, I mean, he went, torched San Francisco and balled out versus Kansas City, right? Threw for 300 and rushed for 80, you know, versus San Fran last year. And so the, what does it look like in game tape? I got to have some of that. And then you got to have the potential upside for what else have I seen in preseason has been really good, talented guy upside. And he got 10 million guaranteed $15 million deal to go to Denver. There's not another backup in the quarterback making backup quarterback in the league, making as much money as Jarrett Stidham sitting behind one of the highest paid players in the NFL Facts. in Russell Wilson. There's not another one of those. And so that's an interesting one where I go, I kind of get the upside. I get the context and the foundational and been a part of an organization that was going to Super Bowls. I love the answer about Lots. being connected to Brady. And apparently too, he was, he was going to be the guy, but Cam just owns the locker room. And so Cam yeah, gets a star. Cam owns every locker room. Cam's right. on yeah. these an undeniable force. That's what I'd ask. I go, what happened? They were like, Stidham had a better camp, but Cam Newton, man, it's just Cam Newton. And like, guys, he's a superhero. And that's why like, he can't be a backup though, too. You know, he's, he's on his show saying, oh, I'd back these seven guys up. And you're like, you're too big of a personality to be a backup. You know? Yeah. I mean, he, even, he admitted it. I also feel like the, yeah. the play dropped off to a certain point where you're like, okay, well, what am I, what am I still getting here? But I, I just, there has to be one guy that's played like Andy Dalton's played enough He's played in a million games, but that's the rarity. Like to me, there should be more Andy Daltons. And I think Andy's probably in a place where, yeah, if I ever got to reclaim a starting gig and have a Jeff Hostetler run, this would be awesome. But I'd imagine, you know, nobody would ever really want to admit it, but can you be over it enough to be an asset in the room, knowing the room is not about you, that you're not the priority? And when I go through these lists, I, again, I can't help myself but laughing at the options we were like, that guy's never played. That guy's never, that dude, I have no idea. Like, I'd strictly be picking you because I'm like, yeah, I remember you in college a little bit. And, you know, Stidham's an interesting one because I think local media can like really, really fall in love with backup quarterbacks. You know, they're just always talking them up. For years, I feel like the Patriots, granted, because I was from the area, and I'd be like, you guys are acting like every one of these backups is like worth, worth the second rounder just because they've been around Foxborough for like two years. Um, and that's not really the case. But as we know, they're all going to get replaced by other guys that we have no idea about. At least, I don't know, 60, 70 percent of the names that are on these depth charts. Yeah. So I think the interesting thing is with guys like Andy Dalton, right, is you have to have the humility to right. have been the guy forever. And then essentially you're making a career change, right? You're not a starter anymore. You're the backup. It's a complete like career change. And I think for me personally, I think that's why there's such a disparity between guys backups having starts versus guys like Andy Dalton is so many of these guys like you look at Carson Wentz Carson Wentz doesn't want to go and be the backup somewhere he's waiting around to be signed as a starter and there's not many guys who are willing to make that move and it's it's like you said it's the blind confidence that so many guys don't think they're done in their career they think they can do more yeah I remember when Andy went to Dallas I saw a graphic where basically him and Dak Prescott had identical stats <laughs> like same wins, same completion percentage, same yard. He's going to back up Dak, and you put the stats next to each other, and it was like identical. You know, so well, I can't imagine. I, I can't imagine how often, like, if you you know, and you guys know where the bodies are buried on this one, where you're just like, 
the perception of the two players is is a cavern and the reality is is that one guy isn't really that much better but the perception just absolutely clouds like what we think of him but like look I'm not even doing this to play favors because I know he's your dude I was kind of looking forward to seeing Darnold with Shanahan because I feel like Shanahan will turn anybody like his track record is ridiculous. I have a buddy who I argue with about Shanahan all the time, and I'm like, how many times does Shanahan have to beat you over the head with 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 quarterback success with all these guys? Because Darnold, I remember how he got it going with the Jets, and then it was the Jets, and then it's like, okay, did he get worse, or he just get labeled this guy that doesn't deserve an opportunity anymore? And look, Purdy's been so good that he's not going to get that chance. But I kept thinking that with Darnold and Shanahan, I couldn't wait to see what it could look like. But you know, Purdy's been terrific. It's hard for us to talk about Sam. We're so biased. We're just like such big fans of his. He's one of our best friends. But like, dude, you're spot on. I mean, it, <laughs> I, I want Brock Purdy to play. I, we, I love right. Brock Purdy's story. I think he's a great dude and all that stuff. But like, Sam goes in there. He's so set up to succeed in that that type of offense. Um, I don't know. We can go on and on about Sam. But like, Sam's going to be an outlier on this on this, on this this list here for sure when he gets his next opportunity, whether it's in San Fran or – whether it's somewhere else, but that's a guy who's just been put in an impossible situation. Five coordinators, five years, you know, disaster situation after tough situation. Um, and so again, context, he doesn't have context for great winning championship level football. He didn't have that with Clay Helton at USC. They didn't have that at the Jets. They didn't have that in Carolina. And so what this year is, whether he plays or not, is context. Context is important, right? You have a college education. Did you go to Harvard? You go to UTEP. Where'd you go? That context is relevant. What would you learn at college? We all went to college, but like, what'd you learn there? And I just think there's a lot of quarterbacks where if you don't know, and I've been on a two and fourteen team, and I've been on a fourteen and two team. They're different. They're totally different. Well, how you how everybody goes about the work. I remember Sam telling me early on this offseason, he's like, "It's so crazy. You have all these superstar players on this team in San Fran, right? You look look around, you go, okay, that's McCaffrey, that's Kittle, that's you know what I mean. You see superstar talent." Those are also like the leaders and they're also the hardest working guys. And they're also the guys that are most all in on football in March and April and May. And so, Ryan, I can just tell you, that's not like that in 32 buildings. It's not. And so for Sam to go there and get that context for this is what winning football looks like. This is what a Tuesday protection meeting in season looks like on a team that actually has answers and dials things up up front from a protection standpoint. Until you have it, you don't. And I mean, Kyle Allen, like, been in some some good teams and some bad teams, and like, but now context, like, you speak on it. Has your context changed now playing for the Buffalo Bills as opposed to Commanders, Texans, Panthers? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just different in every building. And I think early in my career with Carolina, with guys like Norv Turner running the offense, and Cam Newton, and Greg Olson, and Ryan Khalil, I think that was an incredible introduction for me into what real football is coming from A&M spread offense and, and Houston just basically run the same thing, right? It was that introduction. And then you go to different places and Houston was kind of a, a shit show last year. And then you come here to what winning looks like and every building has their problems, but it's, it's more of just, you're right. It's the context of winning. And I think in the NFL in games and quarterback play, it, it comes down to like, close games. I mean, we played the Giants and we won by five, right? And they were hurting backups, but every team in the NFL is good and anyone can win any week. It's more of if you know how to win those close games. I've been on a lot of teams where we didn't know how to win close games. And so when it got to the point, we would lose. And it just seems like in this building and just from their track record, they know how to win the close games. Kyle, can you give me a little more depth on that answer and like make it make it positive, right? So where it's, it's Dorsey, it's Allen, where, you know, I think there's, and I'm, I'm doing a bit of a preamble here, but like when you show up to the first day of camp, you think you have a chance to win a Super Bowl. The vibe is just different. Like it just has to be different. So, you know, it's unfair to compare places that have no chance. But can you give me like more depth on the answer of, of things that you do in that room or you have with your OC where you feel like, okay, this is, this is why we're better positioned than maybe other places that I've been in the past? I think in Buffalo specifically, and I think, places that do it really well is there's continuity throughout Josh's whole career, right? Josh has been here six years. He's been in the same offense. It was Brian Dable forever. It was Dable was awesome for his career. And now it's Dorsey, but it's the same exact offense. So there's been continuity. There's ownership in that offense. 
and what's been built. And it's like you said, right? They've had great years. So coming into the off season, like you're expecting to win. You're expecting to be able to be in the playoffs and have chances to win Super Bowls. But I think when you have so much turnover in these organizations, they feel like firing this guy and bringing in this staff is going to help. You know, like this guy's going to be the answer, but there's rebuild processes in every part of that. And so you have to have the patience to wait through that. But the biggest thing that I think has helped Josh's career so much and why the Bills are, are a great team right now is because they kept continuity around him. They invested in him even when early in his career it wasn't great. They invested in him and didn't move on quickly to cover their ass. And now there's ownership of the offense. There's ownership. There's there's leaders on this team who have been here for seven, eight years. Micah Hyde, you know, Jordan Poyer. Um, Mitch Morris, our center, you know, like there's there's foundational elements of this team. And I think when it comes down to those close games, like, you know who you're looking at, like, you know, the guys that are going to make those plays. Like, we know when the game's tight, we were down. We didn't score any points on Sunday in the first half. We have two drives in the second half that are 10 minutes and eight minutes long, and we scored 14 points. Right. We know who those guys are that we're leaning on to help us win those games. And I think that has more of a factor than people give it credit for. So we got this thing called QB to QB. Go ahead, Kyle. We do QB to QB every week. We're going to have you as our honorary QB this week. <laughs> All right. You're welcome. What what round would you pick yourself in? You say you're first round guy? Uh, no. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> Get her. Right, we're probably. all undrafted in this in this zoom. Yeah, anyway, so it's yeah. Okay. I get, Don't worry. About I get. It. I might get a seventh round flyer because if you like, I think that guy would care. Yeah, that guy might he has, care. He has yeah. long term potential, right? He's a pro right. effort He's guy. Good. Yeah, real effort guy. No, care, but we do yeah. QB to QB. We started this with Kirk Cousins last year, where we have our guests on the show ask whoever the next week's guest is a question. They don't know who it is. Kirk Cousins had a, a great question. He asked, what's your best cover zero answer? And then we had Ryan Fitzpatrick on the next week who could give a fuck less about cover zero anymore, but he had a great answer for it because he played Miami for so many years. But um, last guy we had to do it, Baker Mayfield. He asked, what is the one thing that you have to eat on game day? And I think this is perfect for you because you're watching every game, every Saturday and Sunday. So I'd love to hear the the food routine on those days. Well, if I played, I probably wouldn't eat anything. You know, I cannot eat before I work out. I have some training stuff I do here at the house with a coach, and I'm like, I won't eat until after after I'm done. Um, but if we're talking just straight up game day, I try to, you know, this West Coast thing, everybody loves the the time of the games. I personally like to get out of the house for a little bit and then kind of reset my mind. I like the noon kickoff on Saturdays, this 9 a.m. stuff. I, I hate um, but it makes you it makes you up at seven. Like you gotta you gotta get all your stuff done. You gotta figure it out. I like to be light. You know, when I was at ESPN and guys would be going to the cafeteria whacking a cheeseburger and fries, I'd be like, how could I possibly do a show after a cheeseburger and fries? Like I'm just <laughs> I'm just not built that way. I can't do it. I'm not some crazy health nut. I'm not afraid of of probably too many cheat meals every now and then. But I like to start it light. I will go with a very traditional breakfast if possible. I'm not afraid of uh, an acai bowl, which I know there's probably a higher sugar content in there, but you know the fresh fruit on top of everything else. So it feels like I'm full, but I'm still light on my toes, knowing I still have to make it all the way to Cal, trying to figure out what Spavadol's doing <laughs> late at night. Um, and I mean that because he's a great guy. But yeah, I mean, I, pl you know, I played for Spav, man. Spav's the best. I love Spav. All right, so yeah. right. Wait, wait, was he with Sumlin? Yeah, he was. He was with at Sumlin, A and M. He? he was my OC yeah. for the two years at A and M. He's yeah, awesome. Hell I yeah. just was trying to think of a Cal coach, and I, I thought of Spavadol, and I, they should have beat Auburn. So I was upset about that for those guys. They're good dudes. Um, but I, yeah, look, that is a that's a fourteen hour day sometimes on Saturday for me. You mm -hmm. know, the other night keeping your eyes open while Caleb Williams is putting the cape on again against Arizona. Shout out to Jed Fish getting that thing turned around. I actually mm -hmm. like their their freshman that they brought in. That kid was that kid was had Fafita. some juice to him. Um, yeah. yeah, what was his name again, Jordan? Because I Noah Fafita. Fafita, yeah, there was yeah. something about him. Um, I, I, that's one of my favorite games I've watched all year. Watching, watching two this Same. Pac-12 thing just upsets me to to no end. Even as a Northeast kid, I, I hate what's happening here. So I would say throughout the day, probably chicken salad, um, maybe something with rice later on that night. But I need to stay full but still light. Is my answer? You're a seasoned vet. I like it. Yeah, you've you've been doing this. You're not fucking. I've been doing. I've been through the wars. wings all day. Yeah. Hey, yeah. look. There's plenty of those mornings where you woke up. You're like, yeah. should we go out now or what? And yeah. You're like, yeah. <laughs> probably not going to take a ton of notes. All right. All so right, you're so, going to throw a question yeah. now for our next guest. You don't know who it is. So, 
what and I'll send you the the clip when we get it. So what would be a question that you would have? It's probably going to be an NFL starting quarterback. Um, of what you would want to know. It's generic. You don't know who you're asking, but yeah, no, I like this. This is really good. This is really good. The irony. It's would gone have been, some different directions. It's gone yeah. from cover zero to would you rather have fingers for toes or toes for fingers? You know what I mean? Bad. Like it's just yeah. gone. A, a that was our XFL ways. episode, and now we've canceled that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Would you rather be the quarterback, the starter, like the guy all year long, and then you lose in the wild card round? All right. But you 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 had a great season, but then for whatever reason, like people are like, oh, he's a system guy, and they figured you out, and you're out of the league, or. 12 years of cashing checks, but you never got to have your own team. You've been in the quarterback room for 12 years. It's a bit like the Chase Daniel thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of a little – it feels a little specific to say, would you rather be Chase Daniel or Carson Wentz? So let's not do that in case one of those two guys are your guests. But would you rather have your own team for a year and then never be a starter again and out of NFL money in three years or cash checks for 12 years but never having your own team? It's a great question. It's a great, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question because depending on the level of honesty, I think you would get if you if you put it in a vacuum of straight honesty, like a fire pit. I think you get a lot of different answers. Well, look, Danny Cannell was my co-host for a couple of years. He's still a good friend, and you know he would screw up my perspective on quarterback stuff all the time because he admitted he's like towards the end, all I wanted was that check. I didn't even want to play. He's like, I'd be in camp just checking down to everybody because I was like, just keep completions. Just don't completions. Right, like, don't take throw a care of the yeah. football. <laughs> take care of the football. He's like, I became the worst version of me towards the end because I was trying to be the most like risk averse guy ever. Yeah. And I think he had Mike Shanahan towards the end, and he was like, what? What's going on? He's like begging him. He's like, no, no, like you guys can keep three. And then Shanahan like gave him this whole presentation about how rarely the third guy ever takes a snap and like what a waste of a roster spot and money. He was like, hey, this is stupid. We don't need to do it. And, um, you know, look, he, every time I'd be like, dude, you have to eventually want to play. And he'd be sitting next to me and be like, I didn't. I didn't, though. So no, it's it's real around. Like we have Shane Bouchel in our room. He's our practice squad guy now. And he was with the Chiefs for the last three, four years. And Chad Henney was the two. And Shane used to tell me, I was like, when Chad had to go in that playoff game, there's no way he wanted to be in that game. And he was like, dude, Chad, the last thing he wanted to do was to be playing in a game. He's in like year 14. He's trying to collect check. And this is nothing against Chad because he went in and he balled in that game and he made it happen. Even as the year went on and it got cold in Kansas City, I don't even know what year Chad was in, but he was late in his career. Him and Chad would kind of split the scout team reps, and at the end of the year, Chad was like, "Man, it's it's too cold. You got all the scout team reps. Like, I'm good. Like, I'm just I'm just here to to help this team win a Super Bowl. Hopefully." <laughs> and when he had to go in the game, and it, when you get in that point in your career, I've I've been around a lot of guys who've been that point in your career. Like, it takes you so much more to get your body ready, to get your mind ready to go in the game, and you are just hoping and praying to God that that starter on game day doesn't get hurt it's a different story when you're prepping all week to go into the game and you know you're going to play but then on when sunday comes around and all of a sudden in the, the first quarter like zach wilson has to go in the first game thinking that he's going to sit and watch the goat it's a totally different story well ryan thank you so much man this has been awesome uh you've been on your show a couple times and appreciate you coming on ours and uh i'm glad you guys got a chance to meet virtually and we will definitely yeah. this offseason awesome. all get together whether we're um taking jump shots or other kinds of shots but we're we're down and we should all definitely get together and uh appreciate your insight man this is fascinating. Yeah. every time i listen to you i become a bigger fan look man it's a lot of fun for me because it's certainly you know something i care a lot about put a lot of time in it's just fascinating to spend like 20 something years thinking about this position and then going i i may think i i know less i'm a lot less certain than i was when i had less information which may be the entire riddle of this position <laughs>